Our sermon passage this morning is John 12, verses 1 through 8. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and it's on page 92 if you'd like to join. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him, Martha served, and Lazarus, who was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, like children, welcome to your presence. Instill within us a sense of curiosity and wonder as we gather to listen to your word. Amen. So I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think about what is your favorite smell or one of your favorite smells. Think. Oh, just wait. (laughs) You're getting just a little ahead of me. (laughs) Okay, now turn to someone close to you and tell them what your favorite scent is. And if there's a quick story or something tied to it, tell them about that too. Just, you got a little time, do that. Okay, what were your smells? First, tell me your smells. Flowers, cinnamon, coffee. I couldn't hear. Cookies. Fresh. Fresh oranges. Ooh, that's a good one. Wine. Pine forest. New babies, bacon, ba- bacon. <laughs> baking bread, yeah, fresh baked goods or fresh bread, right, right. So, uh, and what were the stories? Were any of those tied to anything? Why you liked them? Yeah? Maybe memories of people, places you've been, things like that, right? I ask this question because our sense of smell is actually quite spectacular. Last week when we were talking about seeing sight, (laughs) um, I said that we can see like 10 billion different shades of color, right? How awesome is that? But our noses can smell over one trillion different scents because we have over 10 million smell receptors in our nose. So dogs are even way more impressive than us, but we are quite impressive in our ability to smell. And we've, and it's tied to so many things like taste, right? We know this because if we've ever gotten a cold and our nose has been like kind of snuffy and plugged up, it means that we can't taste things as well. Or if you've ever eaten something gross or had to eat something gross, Um, For me, it was cooked spinach from a can. We had a requirement in my family that you had to eat a little bit of everything on your plate. Um, And it was spinach from a can and it was cooked and it was awful. Um, (laughs) And what's the trick to eating something bad? Drink something with it, swallow it down. 
<laughs> hold your nose, right? And we know this because, yeah, if you hold your nose and it works because 80% of our taste is connected to our smell. But our smell is the only thing that is, the smell is the only sense that is connected directly to our brain. Smell is closely tied to memory and to emotions. It's part of our limbic system. And I bet you didn't need me or a textbook to say that because I bet when you were talking about smells, even if you weren't saying it to me or they're tied to people, they're tied to places, they're tied to things, your favorite smells, a certain perfume, the spice or taste of food, the smell of rain, right? Suddenly you're being flooded with those memories of people, of places, of things. I love the smell of rain in the spring. That has a different smell than rain any other time of the year, right? Because when it comes down, you smell that earthy smell, and it has a smell of, this is about tied to emotions, right? Potential, new life, opportunity. It just has that smell that I connect to that way. So I wonder with our story today, what memories were created with the sense of smell? And so we turn to our story in the book of John, and as a side note, this story is most likely the same story that's being told in Mark and Matthew about Jesus being anointed in Bethany. In, in Mark and Matthew, they just don't name Mary as the woman. And as this text tells us, we're near the end of Jesus' three-year ministry, and it's six days before Passover. Most likely, Jesus has spent the day traveling on Friday and arrived in Bethany Friday evening in time for Sabbath, and so he spent, in the Jewish culture, Sabbath starts on Friday evening and goes through Saturday and ends Saturday evening at sundown. And so once Sabbath was over, on Saturday evening they had this feast, this feast where people in town now could travel because Sabbath was over, and so they were coming over to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house to join in this party that was going on. And as per usual for that time period, those around the table were reclined, eating dinner. It was a very relaxed party. And Lazarus was seated right next to Jesus. And if I was Lazarus, this would be the seat that I would want to, right? To spend my time sitting right next to Jesus, thanking him, and, and spending all that time just being near him because it wasn't that long ago that Lazarus was just brought back to life. And so this dead man who was in a tomb, came out. And now, to experience that type of miracle, I'd be right by Jesus' side that whole night, too. And as the dinner proceeds, Mary comes in front of Jesus, and she takes a pound of pure nard, this very fragrant perfume, and she anoints Jesus' body. In John, we read that she anoints his feet, and in Matthew and Mark, she anoints his head. It was probably both. This is such an overly abundant amount of perfume that Mary uses that she probably anointed his head and let it drip down and get into the collar on his clothes. And then she kneels at Jesus' feet and anoints his feet and dries them with her hair. I wonder if that last part of verse 3 is a bit of an understatement. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Have you ever broken a perfume bottle or had it accidentally spill? I was traveling one time and I took a very small travel size amount of perfume and it had busted in my cosmetic bag and I didn't know it. And so somehow as I was messing with it, some of that perfume got onto the floor of the place I was staying. And that entire week that I was there, every time I walked into that room, the smell of that perfume was there and present. That smell of that perfume, of that anointing perfume that Mary used, would have been everywhere. We sell perfume and cologne in ounces. A very ex expensive perfume might be like half an ounce or an ounce. Four ounces seems like a, a lot of perfume. And Mary uses a pound of pure nard. There's nothing to dilute it. That smell, that aroma would have soaked into every crevice of that house. 
Not only would Jesus carry that scent, but the house would, and so would everyone that was there. Mary's act was one of sheer devotion, of extravagance, of love. It was intimate and overwhelming and even scandalous. People leaving the dinner party that night were probably not talking about the food or the small talk that they had with so-and-so. They probably were talking about this moment. To have such extravagance shown in their presence. And not only that, but to have such intimate love and devotion shown would have been shocking. In Jewish society and, and in others, women did not take their hair down for anyone besides their husbands. Often it was seen as sensual, and so something like this would have made people uncomfortable. But Jesus has always seen women for more than what society has seen them. He's seen them for more than just objects or baby makers. Jesus has seen, has listened to, has interacted, and has treated women as those who were made in the image of God and who loved God dearly, and who God loves dearly. Jesus had become friends with women, and they had become his disciples. So though this was not meant to be sensual, it was intimate. This was a disciple showing utter love and care and devotion for her Lord. A disciple essentially modeling what Jesus himself is about to model and do with the rest of the disciples before the Last Supper, to kneel and wash their feet as a servant. Mary was humbly kneeling as a servant before her Lord. And she understood the command to love God then, to love God, to serve God. This was uncomfortable and awkward for the group, and Judas speaks up in disgust. What did you do that for? We could have sold it and gave that money to the poor. John is writing this with a bit of hindsight here and, and reminds us that Judas didn't actually care for the poor, but that he really wanted to pocket some of that extra money from selling the perfume. Mary and Judas's response to Jesus are in contrast with each other in this story. One has a genuine relationship with Jesus, a relationship that has changed her life and allowed her to understand that the cost of the sacrifice is not what matters. Jesus is calling for our full devotion, and that deserves all of ourselves, our time, our resources, our very persons. And on the other hand, we have a named disciple, and Judas shows us that unless you have a real relationship with Jesus that allows true transformation, true discipleship, you'll not understand what devotion looks like or that it frees us to live in the abundance of God's grace. Instead, we'll be tied to scarcity, stinginess, and critical of outpourings of love for Jesus. Loving Jesus how Mary did didn't make sense to Judas. And maybe not just Judas in that room. Does it make sense to us to love so openly and extravagantly? As Mary anoints Jesus that evening, she unknowingly anoints him for his future burial. In a week, he will be a corpse and placed in a tomb without any time to anoint his body for burial. So Jesus connects what Mary is doing now to the reality that he is going to die soon. And given that, there's a decent chance that Jesus would have been able to smell the act of Mary's discipleship throughout this last week of his life. The nard most likely would have dripped down on his collar and been on his robe, there were no wash machines back then, right? Or gotten on his hem when she was anointing his feet. That amount could have gotten onto his 
into his clothing, clothing's fa fabric, into his skin. What a marvelous thought that the beautiful aroma of true discipleship and love for Jesus could have stayed with him through a very painful week. Paul, the apostle, speaks many times about the aroma of our lives and Christ's life. And in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, he writes, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Sacrificial offerings in the temple were named as fragrant offerings to God. In Christ Jesus, with his life and service, with his sacrificial death on the cross for all creation, was the ultimate fragrant offering to God. We often talk about modeling our lives after Jesus, being imitators of him. But another way that we could talk about it is that we should strive to smell like Jesus. Strive to smell like Jesus. To have the same fragrant aroma in our life as he did. As we heard earlier in 2 Corinthians, we are to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. We are to be pleasing aromas of Christ before God and those around us. So what does Jesus smell like? He smells like love, right? He smells like grace, forgiveness, mercy, humbleness. He can smell like a meal made for those who are hungry, a cup of coffee bought for an exhausted teacher, a gentle word of encouragement to a spouse or friend after a hard day, a smile given to a stranger, he can smell like clothes donated to those in need. Or Easter surprises given to kids in our community. He can smell like words of love spoken in truth. He can smell like forgiveness offered to our brothers and sisters. The opportunities to smell like Jesus are endless and abundant. And as we go through this series of sensing faith, we are continually being reminded that we are people who have been given these amazing, wondrous bodies that experience God through the world, but that we act in faith with them and through them in this world also. In the church, we still use anointing oils. Some traditions use it at baptisms. Some use it to, to anoint the sick for healing. Some anoint those in leadership as they're preparing for a new role in the church. And we can use anointing oils for many reasons, but ultimately we use it to remind us of the one that we serve, that we are gods. And in view of God's mercy, we are called to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And this is to be our spiritual act of worship. So as we sing this morning, as we close, I'm going to invite you to come up and be anointed with oil. As a reminder of this calling to be this fragrant offering to our Lord, to commit our whole selves to the one whose name we serve. We will do this just very much like we did remembering our baptism. So as you are able, as we sing, come on up. I have uh, f some anointing oil. Remember, we like frankincense in the church. And so we have frankincense and lavender. And so it's interesting the kids couldn't smell it because I can smell it. <laughs> And so, as we sing about, come all Christians, be committed. Let us be anointed and remember the one that we serve, whose fragrance we want to model. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your life, that you lived your life as a fragrant offering to God and our Father. 
that you've gone before us, you've prepared the way for us, you've shown us how to live. And we recognize our calling to model your life, to smell like you in this world. Help us to put on your love and your grace, to wear them like beautiful perfume or cologne. Help us to be strong in faith and a source of encouragement for one another. And may we use the gift of our bodies to honor you. We pray receive now the offering of our lives, our time, our labor, and feed us with your grace. We pray this along with the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.